Okay, so here's our second part in the lecture on multicellular primary producers, seaweeds, or we could call them macroalgaes. Both terms work, but then also the uh, marine flowering plants. So in the first lecture, we talked about how we identify it as a macroalgae, the key features, and then also the differences between the green, the browns, and the red algaes. And we left off with methods of reproduction, asexual versus sexual. Sometimes the algaes do both. Other times they favor one method versus the other. But keep in mind how both methods work. So what we want to start talking about next is the economic value of seaweed. Why do we care about this stuff? Outside of the importance to the marine ecosystem, can we make money off of it? Does it have a commercial or economic value? And the answer is, yeah, it's got a huge economic value to us. Okay, so seaweeds can be boiled down and turned into a variety of different products. One of the products is algin. Now, algin, when it's boiled down and extracted, is used as an emulsifier in a lot of different food items. So an emulsifier is a thickening agent, something that, like the Dairy Queen ice cream cone over here. To make that product thicker, so that the components of the ice cream kind of bond together and give you that nice swirl, algin is often used. So not just food products though, but we can see it in a variety of other products that we use on a daily basis. Carrageenan, similar concept, it's another thickening agent. Um, this one's used in a lot of dairy foods to make them thicker, so more ice cream, chocolate milk. Take a look at your chocolate milk when you guys have that. That's going to be a component of that chocolate milk, again, to make it thicker and kind of bond better together. And then the third one is agar. Now, a lot of you guys, if you've taken a micro course or a course that involves growing bacteria, agar is used to culture various microorganisms. So bacterial plates, petri dishes for pollen tests, mold tests, fungal tests, antibiotic resistance, etc. A lot of times we use different types of agar. So different seaweeds are used, processed, to give us various agar mediums. So not just microorganisms, culturing microorganisms for healthcare, but we'll see it also as a thickening agent in food. Uh, we'll use it as a filler in the pharmaceutical industry. So when various drugs are being made, they need something to thicken it. Uh, cosmetics, so makeup, lipstick, things like that. And then also to protect canned meat. So <laughs> sounds kind of weird, but if you guys have ever had uh, ham, from a can, like one of the big canned hams you get at Christmas time. There's that layer of kind of gelatin stuff on the top of the can inside, sitting on top of the meat. That's agar. It's used to help protect it, preserve it, keep it from spoiling, and seal the can. So a lot of economic value to seaweed and the different marine, what we can call macroalgae. All right, so they're primary producers in the marine ecosystem. Now the second group for us to explore are the flowering plants, what we generally call the angiosperms. How do we classify the plant as a plant versus an algae? How do we separate algaes from plants, etc.? Make sure you guys can differentiate. So if you're looking at something, you go, oh man, is this an algae or is it a plant? What features do you want to look for? Okay, so with plants, plants have true leaves, stems, and roots. The algaes had comparable structures. We talked about blades and stipes and holdfasts. In plants, we say leaves, stems, roots. The big, big difference here is marine plants have a vascular system. They can conduct nutrients and water throughout the body of the plant. Uh, the marine plants, they're adapted to different levels of salt water, 
or salt concentration. Some of them grow directly in salt water, others on the edge. We'll talk about that as we get into some examples here. Uh, their life cycle is dominated by the sporophyte stage. Sporophyte stage is the actual plant body. So when you're looking at a mangrove tree, you're looking at the sporophyte. The gametophyte stage is going to be the pollen or the eggs. That's the gametophyte. We don't see that. Most of the life cycle is here's the tree, here's the grass, here's the plant. That's all sporophyte. And then lastly, marine plants will produce flowers. So we're looking at rhizopa mangle, red mangrove. Those are the flowers of the red mangrove tree. All right, so all the marine plants are flowering plants. They will produce a flower. Now, not all plants in the world are flowering plants. We have pine trees that produce cones. We have other types of plants that don't produce flowers. But marine plants are strictly flowering plants. You will not find a pine tree associated with the marine ecosystem or non-vascular plants or things of that nature. Okay? All right, so now when we look at the marine flowering plants, one group we'll look at are called the seagrasses. Now, I'll tell you guys, if you try to find flowers, wow, it's going to be a tough job. You can snorkel over the top of a turtle grass bed for hours and hours, and you probably won't ever see a flower. They are tiny, they are small, they are unbelievably difficult to find. But they do still produce flowers when we're talking about seagrasses. Uh, when they produce flowers, the pollen is going to be carried by the water currents. So the pollen contains a sperm. That's carried by the water currents to connect to the flower to then go to fertilize the egg. So you're relying as a marine flowering plant, as a seagrass, you're relying on water currents for fertilization. You can also reproduce asexually with a structure known as a rhizome. This is an underground, kind of a horizontal stem that will run underneath the water, underneath the sand, the substrate. And then from there, you can see new plants, new shoots popping up. So here's manatee grass, eel grass, paddle grass, turtle grass, surf grass, etc. And this big thick stem underground here, that's the rhizome on each of these types of grasses. The body leaves, etc., that shoot up from it are all coming from that original rhizome. So it's a method of asexual reproduction in the sea grasses. Now, those are grasses that are found completely in salt water all the time in the salt water. Turtle grass beds are our primary location for all of these. And then you'll get a lot of times a mixture. Turtle grass, manatee grass, sometimes you'll have eel grass, etc that are all growing in the shallow water, locking in the sand, creating a very unique ecosystem. Other marine flowering plants live on the edge of the water. So we call them salt marsh plants. So they border the shallows. So at high tide, they're soaked in water. They're flooded. They're under probably underwater. At low tide, they may not be in water, or they might be in more fresh water than salt water, depending upon the water levels. So these plants, things like cord grass, they're adapted to changes in salt concentration. High tide, a lot of salt. Low tide, little salt. So their bodies, the plant bodies, have to be able to osmoregulate. That's a term from an earlier lecture. Osmoregulate salt and water to make sure, wow, we don't shrivel up or that we don't over absorb water when we're dealing with these different salt concentrations. Salt marshes are very important. A lot of marine animals use them as a habitat. They help control erosion and any fresh water coming from land goes through them, tends to get cleaned and purified before it hits the ocean. So it helps keep the ocean a little cleaner if we have 
functional salt marshes. Now, the problem is these are often destroyed for development. Okay, third group of marine flowering plants we want to talk about are the mangroves. Now, mangroves come in four different varieties, and we'll talk about these as we go through the mangrove information here. But, key things about mangroves. They tolerate partial salt water submergence. So what we're looking at here, some people call this a mangrove tangle. These are all the prop roots that are actually growing in the salt water. And then here's the body of the plant, the leaves, etc. So the prop roots anchor the plant into the water and it helps trap sediment. As the sediment accumulates, mangroves actually build land. They reclaim the ocean by trapping sediment and then accumulating the sediment, detritus, broken down organic matter, and they will form land. This is how sometimes islands form when we're looking at Caribbean or different oceans. When we look at new island development and formation, it's because of the mangroves. <clears throat> now, the mangroves vary in their degree of salt tolerance. The ones closest to the shore, highest salt tolerance. As you move further back inland, less tolerant of salt water. And we'll see this when an island forms, there's this progress or process of succession that will occur where one mangrove will start the island and then a new one starts establishing and then another one and another one. And they actually start to outcompete the previous mangrove group in order for the island to continue to form. So it's a really neat um, ecological process to watch. But as I mentioned, mangroves come in four varieties. Our first variety is the red mangrove. Very, very, very tolerant to salt. This one lives directly on the edge of the water. Okay, so it's very tolerant to salt conditions. So another picture down here of mangrove roots actually in the salt water. Now, the prop roots are what will anchor the mangrove to the, get that out of the way, anchor the mangrove to the sand, to the substrate. So those prop roots are incredible. They drop down in there, they anchor into that sand, and they hold on, they lock on. Because as wave action comes in, it's trying to wash the roots away. But they're incredibly strong and able to actually anchor in. Now the easiest way to identify a red mangrove, first of all, location right on the edge of the water. But secondly, take a look at their leaves. They have egg-shaped leaves. And then if you look at the upper surface of the leaf, it, it's got wax on it. It's shiny. That's why these leaves are shiny here, is they have a wax layer on the upper surface. That is to help decrease water loss and water evaporation through the leaves. So they want to hold on to their water because it's essential for their survival, yet they're living in a salty environment, so they have to have certain adaptations that allow them to survive in these environments. And when we look at this, the seeds, the seeds are these pencil-shaped structures that will actually float. Okay, So down in the bottom here, these are mangrove seeds. It looks like we have five of them there. So that little brown tip and that elongated green stem looks like a pencil. That's the seed of the red mangrove. Now what will happen is that seed will drop and then it'll float around in the water. And the tip, the brown tip, absorbs more water, gets a little heavier, causing the seed to tilt. And as it tilts, the brown part tilts down and then it'll start dragging the bottom, and once it hits a point where it drags the bottom and kind of touches the bottom of the sand, that's when the roots start to spread out and anchor themselves into the sand, and then you start getting a new mangrove growing from that seed that's anchored itself in the sand. As it grows, it throws out prop roots. Prop roots slow the water down, trap sediment, continue to accumulate organic matter, and the mangroves are now starting a brand new island somewhere out there in the ocean. Okay, in our next lecture, we're going to take a look at the other mangroves that will follow the red mangroves.
succession.